And before we go any further, I just want to thank my friend Jamie for getting that audio clip over to me last night. He recorded a couple of songs. We're going to play one at the end. And even though we haven't been able to gather and be able to do the kind of things that we'd like to do, uh, we, you know, I'm really greatly appreciative of him getting that over to me. It's great. The other song we'll play at the end of uh, this part of the service and things. And I want to tell you this morning, I was listening to it and I had tears running down my face. And when I was talking to my wife, I could hardly talk because I was so broken up with how you know, just what I miss, not just in, in in music, but what I miss with people and and all the things that, you know, so many people are going through. So uh, again, Jamie, thank you. So Father, in the name of Jesus, as we begin this morning, Lord, and we talk about grace being a power and, and recognizing how great it is for us, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you invade our lives, not only here in our room. Father, I thank you for the people that are gathered with us today. And I thank you, Lord, for those who are watching us whenever they do, whether it's live this morning or they watch us later on this week. Father, I'm grateful for them, and I just want to thank them for them. So this morning, um, we, we if, you, if you're a first-time listener and things like that, I want to let you know that we do a couple of things. Uh, you know, I, I will be doing the message, what we call the message part and things, and you're welcome to share these things uh, with, with, you know, on your Facebook or whatever works for you in that sense. And also um, at the end of the service, you know, at the end of that piece, uh, we'll be taking communion together. So if you want to get, you know, juice, wine, cracker, bread together, uh, just know that uh, we're going to be doing that at the end of the service. So I want to, I want to, thank a few people that have been helping me. There's been some people who have come alongside us and things. Some of it's been with time. Some of it's been with talent, as you just heard the music. Some of it's been with treasure. And so people have often asked, how can they give? If you're watching from home, the easiest way to give is to use what we call the Tithely app. It's spelled T-I-T-H-E-L-Y. And you can use that uh, others have dropped money off, mailed, things like that. So if you have any questions, uh, my wife and a, a, another person, I believe, are online. So if you need prayer for anything, you have questions about that, you're welcome to uh, just reach out to one of them and they'll make sure that either I get the note or they pray for you right then and there. So just wanted to get to that. So last week I began what I thought was going to be a one-time meeting on on grace being a power and this but it didn't end up that way so i'm going to carry over here with this what we're going to call part two and hopefully we'll get through more of it today but i want to give you a scripture you know one of the one of the, the folks that's here asked me what scriptures we're going to have so this one's going to be out of luke 18 and it's going to be verses 9 through 14 and it says and he spake jesus he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. I'm not an extortioner or unjust or an adulterer, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week and I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast. And he's saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humble himself shall be exalted. Last week, I touched on some things. I, I, I said then, and I'll say it again, it's not our sin issues that keep us from enjoying the salvation of the Lord, but all too often, it's our self-righteousness. It's our thinking that we can do things by ourselves, in ourselves, without any help from others. We just went through a really tough year, COVID, elections, and things like that, and we saw a lot of justification. Now, as the publican said, and this was pre-cross, he said, I am a sinner. No one is a sinner in the sight of God because of the work of the cross. But that does not mean people haven't messed up or had an un, a, a misunderstanding about who God is in their life. And so this morning, I want you just to begin to embrace first and foremost that God loves you, that he loves you and he's extended his hand of goodness towards you, the death and the resurrection of Christ on the cross, opened the door to remove the sin of man. 
And, 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 and some people even believe it wasn't just the sin, but it was the understanding of that, what they believe to be sin. And so I say to you this morning that grace is more than just letting you go for the things you've done wrong or the things that have, others have done wrong. It is the power to change. And so this morning, we're going we're gonna to talk about that a little bit. So using that scripture in Luke, when a person puts their faith in all their religious acts and all their holiness, that will actually block them from the righteousness in their relationship with God. It's not that God isn't in them, about them, and through them. It's just that the way they approach that, that it's all about me and it's not about God. I've figured this all out. I do this. I do that. Spoke with someone the other day, one of my, one of my friends, and we were talking about someone else that we collectively know. And he said, I've known that person for almost 10 years and I know everything about them, but they know nothing about me because it was, was and has been all about that other person. He wasn't gossiping. He was just saying it's really hurtful to have someone who doesn't reach out into my life as much as I would reach out into theirs. And, and so righteousness often, or self-righteousness oftentimes comes across like that. And what it does is it stops the flow of goodness in our life. It's not that God isn't always on the move. He's not always loving us or not always bringing goodness into our life, but it's how we approach that and how we accept that. Romans 9 30 verses 32 through 32 says, what shall we say then that the Gentiles which follow not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith, but Israel which followed the law of righteousness has not attained the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but by works of the law. There's nothing wrong by any stroke of the imagination to gather with others and say, we're having church. The difficulty becomes when we see that as that's our ticket to heaven. Going to church is not our ticket to heaven. Recognizing who he is in our life, that we are the church, is, if you will, our ticket to heaven. The Bible tells us that there are two kinds of righteousness. One is by faith and the other is by works. And righteousness, or by the law rather, and righteousness by the law is based on performance. And, and that is the, the part that, you know, oftentimes as children, our parents have, you know, brought us into a church fellowship where, you know, some people, you know, I grew up with a lot of people who are Catholic and Episcopalian, as well as people who went to Methodist congregational and what we might call, you know, middle of the road or mainline denominational churches. I had very few friends that attended things like Pentecostal or charismatic churches, probably because my parents were scared of them. I'm just kidding. Um, but we didn't see that. And so what happens is, you know, we say we know it's by grace, but all too often parents start bringing the law in to get their children to be obedient and to, to grow in what they want them to do. But it's the goodness of God that draws man to repentance. So it has to be the goodness of God through man that draws someone to repentance, you know? And I have found that, you know, when I question someone's actions and I talk to them about faith they're like well I did this and I did that and I did this and and what I find is all too often it's the person who's just beginning to have an understanding of who Christ is in their life that is really operating in faith the longer we stay in the kingdom, the longer we walk in the kingdom, all too often we get caught up in having, you know, rules and regulations and understanding. But the fact of the matter is we don't do good deeds because we have to, but grace empowers us to do those things because we can. And, and so good deeds aren't the key to our relationship with God. It's our faith in who he is that's the key to our relationship. And the manifestation of those good things in our life is what happens when we allow that relationship to uh, flow through our lives. So clearly, you know, Christ came and he, he hung on the cross for us and he was taken off that cross and he was carried and he was buried but then he had this place of what we call the resurrection where he came out of the grave and that piece is where you and i are at we are in what we call the resurrection of christ um 
you know, and when we see that, that's part and parcel of the grace that's bestowed upon us that allows us to walk in who God is and has for us. You know, people say to me, well, I have to be more holy or I have to do that. Christ came and he made you holy. He made you righteous. He made you joyful. He made you peaceful. You may not recognize that or you may not be cognizant of that. Or you may even know that, but you don't walk in that. And so many of us, myself included, have tried to do the things that would give us that place of peace, give us that place of joy, be better in our lives with those about us as well as our own personal lives. But the fact of the matter is grace, just looking into the eyes of the one who loves us and allowing grace to move through us is what brings us to a place of better works in our life. Again, not because we have to, but because we can. Many people have done great works because of the law. You know, we read through the law and we see that the Israelites came through all these places and they did these things. And, and you know, when they ran out of, you know, when the Ten Commandments wasn't enough, they began to add dietary laws and they began to add all these things. And I'm not saying there wasn't a rightness about those things. You know, we, we live in America and we, we have bathrooms in our house and they have doors you know prior to that we had outhouses but they weren't in the house but until plumbing came along just like the practice of the israelites they did not build the latrines or where they went to the bathroom close to where they were so those laws were good but they weren't the reason that god loved them first corinthians 15 Verses 9 through 10, it says, and this is Paul talking, he says, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. Each one of us needs the power of grace. God flowing through our lives, but all too often we want to practice all these steps to get it when God just says, just begin to walk and I walk with you. Just begin to move ahead in the things, you know, whether it's laying hands upon the sick or it is raising the dead, whatever those things are, it's not about you. It's fully about him operating through you. They did great things under the law. I'm not talking about God things, but many great things were accomplished under the law. How much greater should be the things that we accomplish under the under grace? And 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 that's where we we come to. And so we begin to look at what can only be called the abiding in him. You know, we you and I, we need God's divine grace and power flowing and operating through us if we're going to be everything that he's called us to be we need to have an understanding of who we've been made to be in him titus 2 11 verse tw uh, through 12 says the grace of god has appeared to all men all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly righteously and godly it's not a work but it is because of the grace that has appeared in our life and when we, when we just embrace that, you know, I, I've said for many years, I don't worry about doing something wrong. I'm not saying I don't do something wrong, but I don't worry about it because I know God, I spend time with God. And the more I spend with him, the more I begin to understand who he is, the more I fall in love with him, the more I fall in love with him, the more I want to do the things that are necessary to keep myself in that place of just knowing there's no shadow between myself and God. In him, there is no shadow, but as, as beings here on the earth, we can always put up roadblocks. As I mentioned earlier, one of the greatest roadblocks we can put in place is the one called self-righteousness, where we believe it's all about us. Not by might but only by the power of the Holy Spirit operating through us, that any one of us can ever fulfill the div divine plan and call that each one of us has on our life. I'm going to share a few scriptures, actually quite a few. Um, my wife may be putting these up as we go along. If not, they'll show up in my notes. Acts 4.33 says, And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. That is not changed. 
That peace has not changed. As we give witness to the resurrection of Lord Jesus, great grace begins to move and manifest through our lives. I often take people back to the book of Acts chapter 2 verses 41 through 43 and we see all the things they did that they went from house to house and they broke bread together and they had meals together and they fed the poor and they raised the dead and they taught and they did all these things. They didn't do it because they had to. They didn't do it because they were really strong men and women because we know that wasn't the case. Just witness to the crucifixion comes and they all run away. So it had to come through allowing the power of God to operate in their life. In the book of Revelation, it says that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. That's already done. Overcame by the blood of the Lamb. The word of their testimony. What is the word of their testimony? The resurrection of Christ and the operation. Now, some people say that we weren't there. So we can't give witness to that. I don't believe that. I do believe we were there, you know, because we were created before the foundations of the earth. And so God who lives outside of time had you and I outside of time. Now, I'm not saying we were sitting there with our eyes glued upon the cross, but everybody knew what was happening. The angels, when Christ was born, came and the, the, the skies were filled with heavenly messengers. And then when, when Christ was crucified, the earth sh shook. And even in that, we're told by Paul later on in the book of Corinthians, we, you know, we, we hear about these 500 saints that were brought out of the earth who had been previously dead, were wandering around the city. So in that, there was an understanding that there was this power in the recording of that. People say, well, I don't believe in the Bible. Okay, well, that makes it really difficult for you, and that's okay. Ironically, you know, I'm always amazed that, you know, there's, you know, Homer's Iliad, and there's only like one real copy of that, but we find 1,400 different writings about the book of Matthew, but we, many have just tried to discredit that, but they'll read Homer. It, it, it's not logical, and it doesn't make sense. Second Peter 3.18 says, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in the grace. It's not something that's just been given to you, but it takes, I'm going to use the word, it takes effort, if you will. And people say, well, I thought you said it wasn't about work. So let's just say you need to focus on what you want to grow in. So, you know, like if I plant a garden and I want watermelons, I plant watermelon seeds. If I want radishes, I plant radish seeds. If I want grace, I need to allow for that to grow in my life, just as it would, you know, a radish or a watermelon would grow in a, a, a garden. 2 Timothy 2.1 says, You therefore, my son, be strong in grace that is in Christ Jesus. You're in Christ, Christ in you, and grace is found, it tells us, in the person of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, ha always having all sufficiency in all things, have an abundance for every good work. Everything that you and I want to do that is a good work, grace has been abundantly provided in our life. The very name of our fellowship is because I so believe in the abundance of grace to do good things in our life and in the lives of, you know, of, of others. 1 Corinthians 1, 4, uh, chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift. All too often people have said, I have this gift, I know I have this gift, it was prophesied over me, people have told me this, but I don't do anything with it. That's because you're relying on legalism and you're not relying on grace. That just did in a nutshell. We're told in 1 Corinthians that you have gifts. You have the ability to yield to the Father and manifest what we call the nine spiritual gifts, if you will. Each one of us has been made a gift. And the ability to operate in that is predicated not upon the grace of God in the sense, 
God gave me a dollar bill, now I can go buy ice cream. No, what he's saying is, it is a living, if you will, staying with that analogy, it is a living dollar bill that goes with you. And no matter how much you try to do with it, it just never changes. It keeps getting bigger in your life. And then let me just finish up that verse. So that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4, 7 says, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. This is where you know that you are a gift to the body of Christ. You may have a talent in music, but you have a spiritual gift that God has made you to be. You may have a gift in art, but this is the spiritual gift that God has made you to be. And you walk in it because of grace. Now, I, I'm not going to lie to you. There's many people who are out there doing their thing in ministry, if you will, who aren't even graced for. And they're always talking about burnout and how difficult it is and how they have to do that. That's legalism. It's because they're not operating in the grace for the gift they have. Because in God, there is a rhythm of grace. You know, the message translates where Jesus says, come unto me, all who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. What he's saying in there, in the message uh, translation, he's saying there are rhythms of grace. And in that rhythm, some days you, you won't accomplish as much. Maybe those are the days that God's recharging your batteries, if you will, or spending time with you. Other days you'll be pouring out, and it just seems like the day was too short to get all the things you wanted to do, to see all those people. How did the, how did the apostles and the deacons do it in Acts 4? Uh, be, uh, Acts 2. They did it because they believed in the grace of God and allowed it to carry through into their lives. Romans 12, 6 says, Having then gifts, here we go again, you are a gift. You have a gift. Don't think that you don't. Don't say, well, God didn't give me this. God gave you everything, tells us in another place. God gave you everything pertaining to life and godliness. That word godliness has to do with our walk with God. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. You know, people, people over the last year have complained about COVID and elections and every other blessed thing in the world. But instead of practicing what we know and walking these things, let us use them. When people are using their gifts, God is in the midst of it. It's not that he's apart from the difficult times of COVID elections, whatever. It just means he's there as an observer, if you will, until someone says, you know what? I believe in grace and I'm going to operate in that. How much would change? How many people would not have died? How many people would not be, have been sick? How many things would have been changed in the elections? Not because we're praying for an election, but because God is manifesting himself in the midst of all those circumstances as we use the gift that God made us to be. If prophecy, continue on from Romans 12, 6, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Well, I'm faithless, people would say. No, you've been given a measure of faith. If you've ever studied about faith in the Bible, you'll see it talks about a mustard seed of faith. The smallest seed on earth becomes the thing that moves mountains. 1 Peter 4, 10. As each one of us has received a gift, minister it to one another. You are a gift. You have received a gift. It is time to get out of your shell, stop believing in the legalistic structure of the law, and say, you know what, this is my day. I'm going to walk in it. I'm going to see creative miracles in people's bodies. I'm going to see the dead raised. I'm going to see people healed. I'm going to see, you know, if great miracles happen in the Old Testament, like the woman where the prophet shows up and he goes, make me a cake. And, you know, before too long, all of a sudden, you know, he sends her out, she goes and she gets all these buckets and things from her neighbors, all these pottery things, and she brings them back until everybody's she's got all their, all their pots and pans. And then they fill with oil, sell it and take care of things. If those things exist in the Old Testament, how much greater are those things under the rock and rule of grace? 2 Thessalonians 1, 11 through 12 says, To this end, we always pray for you that our God may be made 
may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. It's about his power. It's about him doing these things through our life so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So those, those are some of the scriptures that you can meditate on and just toss them up to God. Lay on your bed. Say, God, I'm going to read the scripture. Talk to me. God is talking to you. Take the time to listen. The early church, if you will, Acts 2, you know, when we read through the book of Acts, they had four devotions. And I think that one of the things that we've missed out on is all too often, the church has forgotten about these devotions, if you will. It came down to the apostles' teaching or the, the apostles' creed. But in that, it talked about one holy church. It talked about how great God was. It talked about all these things. It talked about the fellowship of the brethren. Now, I understand it's difficult in this COVID era, if you will, to get close to one another. I have people in my living room, the place we normally meet, Best Western. They're not opening their conference room. This morning, I have people in my living room while I'm doing this broadcast here. Where, you know, But if there's a fellowship. And just because I can't gather up with 50 other people, I can meet with those people on a regular basis. It comes down to the breaking of bread. One of the reasons I... I I so greatly care about the communion is not only is it a reminder, but it is a reality of who the church is. I talk to people all the time. Uh, I ask them straight up, do you take communion with your family? Nope. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to beat them up because that's not in keeping with the scriptures. But if you're going through tough times with family members or you're battling sickness, this is the answer. This is the answer. Um, and the other one is prayer. And it's not just about, you know, I'm, I'm going to use the word corporate prayer. I mean, I absolutely believe in corporate prayer when Jesus shares that, you know, what we so often call the, uh, the Lord's prayer. The very first line tells you to pray with others. Our father, not my father, our father. And that tells you that there is a reality to getting together with people. Again, in this time where people are concerned about leaving their house or they live far away, we can pick up the phone and pray with one another. Uh, I, I work really hard. I'm not saying I always accomplish it, but if somebody ca calls me or reaches out to me on Facebook, I always want to make sure that I pray for them. Because as good as my counsel might be, because of the time I've spent with the Lord, I want the Lord to invade their life. It's not about them being an unbeliever. It's about the power of God breaking through into the areas of their life. Earlier this week, I was ta I've, I've talked to a number of people about this. You know, we use this word trigger in our life. And it, you know, people say, well, that triggers me and toxicity triggers me. And, and you know, I, I get it. There's people that have come into my life that are difficult. But I also understand that they're in my life because that is my divine connection. Sometimes the greatest lessons I've learned have come from the most toxic people around me. And I'm not saying I necessarily go look for those people all the time, but I also recognize when they come into my life, there's a reason that they're there. And that reason may well be that God is trying to reveal something to me not saying he won't reveal something to them but as many might also say we've been around people who do not seem to listen but we always come away changed back to triggers triggers are those things that happen maybe you had a bad experience as a child or you know whatever those things are when somebody says something a certain way it makes you cringe those triggers there's two parts to this. One is they're like the check engine light on your car. When it goes off, you know you might have a problem with your vehicle. I understand it could be as simple as a gas cap being loose. But it would be foolishness not to pay attention to that. But I also know when I get that ping that I need to look at why is this affecting me. 
And if it's affecting me predicated upon past experience, then that's an area of my life I need to submit to the Lord. Because triggers just show you that things are not healed in your life. It's not a diss. People can go around all their life and avoid the circumstances that perhaps created that trigger, but it doesn't give them healing and freedom. I have way too many friends that have various forms of PTSD who, and myself included, just a few weeks ago, a situation came up and I had that momentary place brought back to me. And I went, okay, God, you're showing me that because you want to heal that. God wants to heal our memories. He doesn't want us to disregard them, but he doesn't want a person who might have abused us or beaten somebody or whatever. He doesn't want that person to maintain power over our life. He wants to bring healing to you, and he wants to bring healing to that person. Many, many years ago, probably in the late 90s, I long ago read that scripture that said, vengeance is mine, said the Lord. And I realized that whatever kind of, in quotes, vengeance I had for people was nothing compared to what the Lord would do in his love. And I knew God wasn't going to go out there and be punitive with them, but his goodness would draw them to change. It was one of the greatest revelations I had in those times. People's lives will be changed because of you. Your life will be changed because of you when you begin to embrace grace. I like systems. Anybody that knows me knows that I appreciate systems. Just this morning, I was sharing with one of the men in our fellowship who's here that the only time I start to develop, if you will, a degree of anxiety in the course of my week is getting ready to do this message. It's not because of the message, though sometimes I have trepidation about that, if you will, that I share with you what God is saying in a way that doesn't bring glory to me, but brings glory to him. But it's like there's an anxiety that begins to happen as I try to think through the system that I need to accomplish to get this message out there. This morning or last night when my friend sent me over a couple of audio clips, I was like, great. And then I thought, how the heck am I going to do this? Is it even going to work? And so this morning, my wife went upstairs to take a shower or something. I sat here this morning trying to get it to work. I had to record it to make sure it came back on to make sure that what I recorded happened. So I tell you that to say I like systems. But God is not a system. I don't believe there's 12 steps to reaching God. I don't think there's five steps to perfect prayer. I think that God is just looking for us to get out of our self-righteous mode and embrace who he is. Begin to just see him for who he is. When I lay on my bed, I make every effort not to go to the Lord with an agenda unless it's like, God, I'm feeling anxious about this. And then I let it go because the Bible tells us to cast our cares upon the Lord for he is good and he's going to do things in those areas that I'm willing to release to him. But self-righteousness doesn't allow us to release those areas. Grace allows us to release the areas of trouble or the areas of concern that are in our life. So when I lay on my bed, I make every effort not to go there with an agenda but just say, God, this is my time to look into your eyes. And the more I look into his eyes, the more I understand that we are a carbon copy of the Lord, made in his image, that the more I look at him, the more I change, not because of I'm physically or mentally or even spiritually trying to ascend to it, but because the Lord is causing me to see who I am in him. So grace is a power, and it's a power that the church desperately needs to embrace. We need to understand that it's not just a letting go of someone's sinful 
things, but it's actually the power that will help them to change. You know, as a young believer, um, you know, I, I, I believe scripture was important. I still believe it's important. I don't see it the same way all the time as I did years ago. But I, but I wanted to implement a verse in someone's life. I'll give you a simple one. You don't work, you don't eat. Anybody besides me ever said that more than 500 times? Probably not. We say that. And while grace allows someone to work, when we put a legalistic spin on it and make it a condition of relationship, we are no better than the Pharisees. We are no better than the Sadducees. I read the Bible and I look for life in it. But again, because I like systems, sometimes I start doing that thing over and over again and expect the same response. And then all of a sudden, God just kind of pulls the plug on me and says, hey, back to you and me. It's not about that. It's about us. So grace is the empowerment to see ourselves as God sees us. It's a free gift. We couldn't earn it. We didn't earn it. And every time we start to put our spin on something, we lose sight of the fact of what grace is. This morning, I want to do a couple of things as we come up to the end of this. Um, the first one is, we are going to take communion this morning. But again, this friend of mine shared an audio, and I want to say this to people who are listening. Um, he gave it to me on Facebook, so I couldn't do with it what I wanted to do. So unfortunately, I have to listen to it through the Facebook thing or whatever, you know, Messenger. But later on today, I sent him a note and he said, I'm sending them over to you by email. And when I receive those, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up those two audio clips. They're both done by my friend, Jamie. I'm going to put up those two audio clips. And I want us to have an understanding that, you know, there was, there's, when, when this song that I play for you comes out, I don't know how you're going to respond, but as this is the song that I played this morning. And when I played this song this morning, the very first note, just talking about it, I get chills. The very first note of this caused me to begin to weep in joy. And it's a long song, so if you're not into music, I used to say, get over it, because you're going to really have a hard time in heaven. But I'm not going to say that this morning. I want you just to take some time. Maybe you use it to gather your bread, your wine, your cup, whatever it is. At the end of this, we're going to take communion together. And Jamie, I just want you to know if you're listening, I so greatly appreciate you doing this for me. You'll hear it coming up in a second. I'm going to cover the camera just so I don't get in your way. Yeah. 
So again, I'm really grateful to my friend Jamie for recording that. So we're gonna take communion right now. So uh, in our house, the elements have already been passed out. If you're taking communion with us, bread, cracker, cookie, whatever it is, cup, juice, wine. Um, you know, it was a practice of the church. If you're interested in more on that, you can go back and you can see where I taught on powerful principles. This is one of the most powerful principles we can place before us. The bread representing the body of Christ. But there's a reality to this. I don't think the Catholic Church necessarily missed this. They believe in a, a thing called transubstantiation. That when they took this cracker, this wafer, if you will, when they take this, there's a reality of Christ that's once again brought up inside of them. Now, I would say to you that I don't deny that Christ is ever, you know, I don't think Christ ever leaves me. But there's something about this in the belief that we put into this. It's not just a religious endeavor or something symbolic, but it's actually a sacrificial piece where we say, God, your body was enough for healing and wholeness, that you bore 39 stripes upon your back that we might have completeness in our life, that the very things we're concerned about were consumed in your body. And so on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he distributed it amongst his disciples. And he said, this is my body. As often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. The Lord Paul came along later on in Corinthians and said, do not wrongly discern the body of Christ. I do not think it necessarily means the body of Christ, the cracker or the bread, or the body of Christ, the people of God, or any of that, even on a misunderstanding of you, but to say, People are people and we're one. So today we take this as one, regardless of where we sit. And in like fashion, he took the cup, took the wine, and he said, this is significant of a new covenant. The very covenant that I just shared about, the covenant of grace, is because of the blood of the Lamb. Because of the blood that he shed. I have a new and exciting life because you and I live in the resurrection of who Christ is. And so we take this cup together as one. So I want to pray for each one of you before we close out this broadcast here and say, Lord, deliver them from evil that they might find fulfillment in all that you have for them, that once again, if they've been disheartened, discouraged, disappointed, for whatever that reason, they would come into, your, in, into a place with you and say, God, I love you. As the publican came and he beat upon his chest and he said, God, I've done wrong things, but you are God. And so this morning we say to you, God, you are God. Bring healing into the lives of the people that watch this, the people that are in our friends and family, 
and Lord, bring blessing into their lives. We will be back next week. This will be up on our YouTube channel. You'll be able to listen to the audio podcast. I promise you that I will get Jamie's music up there and we will go from there. Thank you and God bless you.